Mac Voices TV is brought to you by PDF Pen for iPad from Smile, the mobile version of the award-winning Mac PDF editor. Use it to sign a contract, make corrections, fill out an application, make comments on a presentation, and much more. It's the mobile app that doesn't feel like you left the important features back at the office. Welcome to Mac Notables. This is the home of the Mac experts you want to hear from. I'm Chuck Joyner. Joining me this time for something that we've done before, but it's still fun to do, is Mr. Adam Angst. Adam, it's great to have you. Thanks for being here. No problem, Chuck. It's always fun to, uh, to do these as well. And you feel like you're killing two birds with one stone. You get to talk to a whole bunch of people, and you know they're there. It's not just people listening after the fact. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're not alone this time. This time, we get to talk to the Southern California Macintosh Owners Users Group in Southern California, also known as SMOG. SMOG, it's great to see you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to ask, SMOG? Yeah, I was going to say, come on, I'm dying here. <laughs> This is this is this has got to be the best the best uh, the best uh, you know user group acronym I've heard in a very long time, especially for Southern Cal. <laughs> yeah, who, well, whose yeah. idea was this? <laughs> the group was formed uh, 20, 21 years ago. We celebrated our twenty first anniversary last month in September. Um, and when the group was being formed, Elaine, who is our P patriarch, she's not here today. It's the first meeting she's missed in years. Uh, but I believe she came up, coined the term because we're in Southern California, you know, land of smog. They came up with the acronym Southern California Macintosh Owners and then a users group and then dubbed it smog. So that's what we are known as. And the voice you're hearing, folks, is Devin King. He is the, I believe, Devin Vice President and Program Director. Do I have that right? Yes. yes. And he, he arranged this. So we, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and uh, share some some Macintosh and iOS stuff, and uh, it's it's always fun to communicate with other Mac enthusiasts everywhere. So that's great, and I'm I'm with Adam. That smog is pretty good. That's going to be hard to beat. The 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 best one actually, you know, was my first Mac user group ever uh, in Ithaca. Um, it was Mugwump, which actually was an acronym. It stood for Macintosh User Group for Writers and Users of Macintosh Programs. And, <laughs> That was I, w I was always really pretty happy with that one. Then there's a, there's, a, there's of course the Syracuse group. I mean, you guys have smog, but they're smug. So <laughs> yeah, there, there are plenty of good ones out there. I admit, but I, 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 smog just seems to fit so well with Southern Cal for some reason. <laughs> the uh, the Rochester group that I just talked to last week is also pretty good. I don't know what their acronym off, uh, is offhand, but they're Apple Cider, where the cider is the acronym. So. Well, we, we talked to Devin and we said, you know, what would you all like to hear us talk about? And so they decided they'd like to hear Adam and I talk about some of our favorite apps, Mac and iOS, which it seems to be always a moving target, Adam. I don't know about you, but I, when they asked me to do this, it's like, okay, I've got a lot of old favorites. Things come, things go. Sometimes things fall off the map. How about you? Yeah, I won't say that things fall off the map too much. I think I more add programs. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm bad that way because you know to a certain extent. I mean, the only time something is going to fall off the map for me is when it ceases to do a task that I need, or if frankly my my, t my tasks change a lot. But that doesn't happen too often. So for me, for most of the time, it really comes down to you know I start doing something new and need a new app for it and wow there's this great thing that is just wonderful and I start using that a great deal so you know one of the apps um, that we'll be talking about um, later today is something I've probably been using only for a couple months now and um, and yet I just you know I love it because not so much the app is actually that fabulous but because what it gives me access to and I mean I think that's one of the big lessons about all of these things is it's not necessarily the app but what the app enables you to do you know, I agree. And looking through mine, I've I was focusing more on things that are productivity based. That'll either make my life easier, solve a problem, or let me do something. It's I think we all go through that phase of all. Oh, there's here's this cool new app, and you play with it for a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then you sort of move away from it. But the ones oh, I yeah. put down on my list are the core. Well, and it's interesting for me because on my Mac, it's actually fairly easy for me to determine my my favorite apps because. I can just tell what's up in front of me at all times. You know, what am I relying on day in and day out? 
On the iPhone or iPad, it's a little more difficult because you know you you can sort of you can sort of tell by what's migrated towards that first home screen or even the dock. But you know, there's apps that are on my dock, for instance, which I use a lot, but I think are really pretty horrible. Um, Apple's Podcasts app, for instance, I sort of haven't gotten around. I, I keep trying to, to tr you know, to trick it into uh, using data when it shouldn't. So I keep using it, even though I think it's a pretty miserable app. And and you know, so that's a good example of something I do use a lot, but it's not a very good app. But on the other hand, you know, stuff that makes it up to the front of my home screen is stuff that I usually do rely on in some way. And those are the things that I'll be focusing on today. Great, great. Well, you know, when you got your list in before I could, so you stole some of the picks that I would have had. Uh, so we will agree <laughs> on some of those. But something you didn't do unless you were going to talk about it and didn't really put it down, I found that there were certain either apps that are cross-platform, meaning Mac and iOS, or that work in conjunction with something on the other platform that, that made my list just because I find myself doing more with my Mac but with my iOS devices too in, in a unified hmm. environment. Interesting. I don't actually. Um, my, my, I, I use my iPhone all the time. You know, It puts me to sleep at night, wakes me up in the morning, and is in my pocket all day. So I use, I use my iPhone for a lot of different things. Um, I use iPads very occasionally that I don't find them particularly useful. They don't do anything better than the Mac can do and for the kinds of work that I need. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sitting here with two 24-inch monitors in front of me. You know, having an iPad is not, not really a big win for most of the kinds of tasks that, that occur in my everyday life. And so, you know, I think probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the majority of the apps that you're using cross-platform are Mac and iPad rather than Mac and iPhone. But I'll be curious if that's true or not. Mm, yeah, not really. Not necessarily. Okay. No. Um, no. You know, cause, I, mean, I mean, for instance, a good example, um, the podcast app, you know, which, again, miserable app. I'm not recommending it. But um, before it came out, that was something that I relied much more on my Mac to do that iTunes handled podcast subscriptions and iTunes use subscriptions and all that kind of stuff and just sync them over to the iPhone. So I sort of felt like there was more connection there. Um, now that I have the iTunes U and podcast apps, um, it's all handled directly on the iPhone. And I couldn't care less if it's on the Mac. I, I never listen to a podcast on the Mac. I never, on the Mac, I never look, listen to an iTunes U lecture on the Mac. So I couldn't care at all about having those files there or integrated with iTunes in any way. Um, there's just no connection. Interesting. We, we'll get to this because, the, you know, the, the one thing I do want to let the folks at Smog know and also the, the listeners, uh, I will have links in, to everything we do recommend in the show notes. So, uh, folks, feel free to take notes if you want or just wait until this comes out and you'll have hot links straight to the applications just to make sure we get them right. Adam, how about if I let you start? Pick pick your uh, your poison, Mac or iOS, whatever works. Mac for you. or Mac? Let's go with Mac. I mean, it's still the you know the southern you know the Southern California Mac user group. So, um, I didn't really order these when I when I submitted them. Um, so let me let me think here about my my, the, my, my picks. Um, I guess I would say that the app that I actually is gonna is gonna hit number one for me in this regard, um, because it or something like it has been on my Mac since 1988 when I first got a Mac, um, and that's Keyboard Maestro, written by Peter Lewis of Stairway Software. Um, back in 1988, the first two Macintosh programs I bought were Quick Keys by CE Software and um, uh, Suitcase, um, then by Fifth Generation Systems. Wow, exercising some 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 memories there. Um, and but Quick Keys, the reason why I wanted it back then was it let me automate stuff. It let me say this task I have to click here, copy this information, switch this other application, paste, and do it all over again. And any number of different uh, tasks that, that Quick Keys allowed me to do. And I've gone through a number of these kind of macro utilities. Quick Keys was the first, but, um, you know, I used iKey. I've used, oh gosh, uh, I'm trying to think of the names of some of them. I've probably gone back to Quick Keys once or twice in the process. Um, there was something. Uh, it's homepage just changed. Launch. Launch. <laughs> But I can't even think about it. I think West Code Systems was the company. But all sorts of these, these, these keyboard utilities 
that um, that really give you some ability to make the Mac act repeatedly in a way that you don't want to. And Keyboard Maestro is as the latest of these, but it doesn't even have to be um, multiple actions. So, for instance, one thing that I have done since uh, time immemorial is I have mapped the function keys on the top of my keyboard to specific apps. So F1 always, always launches my word, whatever program I use for my word processor. F2 always launches my web browser. F3 launches my email program. F4 launches my file transfer program. F5 launches my calendar. Um, F6 launches iTunes. Um, and, you know, there's others too, but those are the ones that have literally have not changed in decades. And so it is completely built into my muscle memory to reach for F1 whenever I'm writing now in DBEdit. Just so the um, so that's one of the things that I find um, just makes a whole lot of difference for me is being able to have something that allows me full control over my keyboard, full control over uh, multiple sets of repeated actions, and you know, even something as simple as typing cheers dot 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 dash Adam at the end of every one of my email messages, Keyboard Maestro does that for me. So, you know, I hit control period at the end of every email message, you know, so reflexively after doing it, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times undoubtedly over the years. And so that's number one for me. That's a good choice. And I know there's another choice that sort of fits that bill for me, so I'm not going to not going to spoil it. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm surprised that you are that much of a keyboard guy, Adam, that because there's oh, this little thing happening. Oh, has totally. The dock? The dock? The dock? The dock? I predate the dock. <laughs> I never liked the dock. I think the dock is pointless. I mean, you have to go over. Well, for me, first of all, I have to put the dock over on the right-hand side of the monitor because putting it at the bottom is just is just wrong. I mean, I don't know why Apple does that because it wastes precious vertical space on monitors which have more horizontal space than they have vertical space. Plus, you usually need to scroll. You don't scroll horizontally. You scroll vertically. And so, if you put you know your dock at the bottom, that gives you less vertical space, causes more scrolling. So it's a bad design decision. It always has been. Um, but the dock. You know, it's new to Mac OS X. There were apps that did this sort of thing in, in previous versions of, of the Mac OS, but, you know, I never used them then either because the fact of the matter is that I can hit F1 without looking. I can't hit anything on the dock without looking. You know, that the keyboard is something you do not have to be sitting there, heads down, looking at something or kind of reviewing over to the side. Oh, not to mention the fact, how many items on your dock are small blue circles? I mean, really, count them right now. I've got five, maybe six apps on my dock that are small blue circles or circular and, and about the same shade of blue. I mean, it's not a good interface um, for anyone who is really trying to get a lot of stuff done. Plus, I run a lot of apps, so they, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and unless I pin them to a specific spot, they move around, having to hunt for them, not a good idea. So, so you know, whereas I can switch to BB Edit with F1 anytime, wherever I am, without thinking. Same with other diff, you know, other types of uh, other types of apps. So, so that makes a big difference to me. Um, one of the things that I think, and this is this is maybe a bigger lesson. I mean, sort of uh, when Launchpad came to Lion, and Apple's like, oh, we've learned from iOS. It's, it's so easy to use, and everyone who'd been using a Mac said. What's wrong with every other way I've used, learned to use to launch apps? I mean, come on. It's not any easier than any of the rest of them if you have figured out how to launch apps already. And so I think this is one of the lessons is, is if you've figured out something that works for you, stick with it. Don't feel the need to believe that Apple know, somehow knows better than you do how you should use your Mac. I'm not going to argue with that. I, I, I think I'll use that as a springboard for the, one of my Mac picks, um, and that's LaunchBar. Uh, I, I, I tend to agree with oh, you. Oh, 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 you've got one of the good ones. Sorry. I, I agree with him. <laughs> That's the other uh, one I use the most. Yeah, Launch Bar is just sort of like Adam was talking about, just muscle reflex. If I want to open an app, I – let's see, what do I do? My, I don't even know. My hands know. I guess it's <laughs> command space. Spinal core. Yeah, and it, it drops a little – little search menu down, which you don't even have to think about, and type start it to type in the first couple letters of the uh, of the app, and it launches, and and that's it. I mean, it's a very non-invasive interface. Now, I happen to like the dock for other reasons, and that's a whole other discussion. But as far as launching, I'm I'm with you. The only thing that launch launchpad does is it does give you a place to go and look 
for your apps if you can't remember what something was. And I know you can argue that you can go in the applications folder to do that too, but I I, I don't mind Launchpad. I just don't use it. See, um, but here's 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 what we, I mean. And, and uh, you know, I understand that people's brains work differently. Um, but for me, what is the, what is Launchpad, or even going to look in the applications menu, going to tell me that I wouldn't know by launch bar? If I don't know the name of an app, I'm not going to be able to find it. I mean, I, don't you know, don't you find sometimes that maybe I, I I don't remember the name of the app, and I know it's there, and I just if I see it, I will know it. No, definitely not. I'm a word guy. For me, everything is words. I, images mean nothing to me. So, so, I mean, that's partly why I don't like the dock. Um, images are all, all these kind of, you know, little, little blue circles off to the right. Um, they really don't have much meaning. And, and you know, back in the day when um, particularly Microsoft started to do a lot of toolbars, I was like, oh, what are you thinking? They all look like little blobs. You know, they don't have any, any particular meaning, and you can't necessarily even figure out why this one uh, this one um, icon means save and this one means print you know that doesn't look like a printer that I've ever seen and and you know and save as a floppy disk I mean how many years has it been since we've seen a floppy disk in action so you know some of these things they're just you know they get people get companies get caught up in the oh we have to be more visual more graphical more iconographic um, but you know, language is pretty powerful, and um, I'm a really big fan of language. So Launchbar, I mean, as I said, I'm, I'm almost kicking myself that I didn't put it on my list. I don't want to imply that it's not one of my absolute most used applications because it is. The reason why I didn't think of it is because, again, it's so ingrained in muscle memory. You know, you hit Control Space, you type, boom, it's there. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm fast enough with it. I actually don't even usually see things appear in Launchbar. Um, by the time I've hit return and I've switched to the other app or, or launched the other app. And I use that not just for apps, but also a lot of um, like databases um, when, I'm, when I'm launching the same document over and over again. And so it's not, it doesn't have to be just an application. Um, LaunchBar has a bazillion other features too, which I, I always feel a little badly that I don't use just because I love it so much. But, um, but realistically, you know, it's easier for me to do, you know, use the calculator somewhere else than to pop up LaunchBar and somehow, you know, start, start adding in it. And, and Adam makes a, the point I wanted to make sure we touched on. You know, we're talking about LaunchBar as a launcher, but he's right. It has so many other features. You can launch web pages from it. If you have the bookmark, you can, you can launch documents. One thing that I think is greatly overlooked in LaunchBar and there are plenty of other great apps that do this, but it has a, a, uh, a clipboard history in. Yeah. So that if I do launch, launch bar and do an, a, a command K, I can see, well, I think I have mine set for the last 20 or 30 items that were on my clipboard. Which, if you haven't used a clipboard utility, you can't believe how useful that is. So, so in fact, the reason why I don't use that um, is because Keyboard Maestro has the same feature. And and so, but yes, it's really common to say, oh, I just want the thing that was on the clipboard second to last. You know, I don't want the last one. I want the one that was just before that. Because, you know, you're copying two pieces of information, someone's phone number and their address. Ugh, now I have to go back and recopy it, blah, 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 blah. I actually have a macro in Keyboard Maestro. So, you know, Command V pastes, but uh, some other macro involving V, again, my hands know it, but I'm not sure what it is, um, paste the second thing I copied so that I can actually get to those qu even more, you know, even quickly. And then, you know, another, another macro, yeah, it pops up the whole list so I can just select from, from the list if I need to go back three or four items. But um, the other thing I wanted to say about LaunchBar, which I absolutely adore and use all the time, is you can, you can have, it can search for you. So I will often, you know, hit Control Space um, to la open Launch Bar, type a W for Wikipedia, and then type a word, and it will do the lookup in Wikipedia for me. Um, you can do that, and you can you can set up your own search. They call them search templates. You can set up your own. So you know, so I search Amazon, Google, Wikipedia, and the Tidbits website uh, in those in those fashions all the time. And it's just again just so easy to do. And you don't even have to, you know, switch to your web browser, you know, hit, hit Command L or, you know, click in the address field, anything like that. You don't have to look for a search field. It's all keyboard driven. And so, again, if you're a keyboard person, that's really helpful. Um, again, being a word person, I'm really a keyboard guy. Um, I actually have always used strange pointing devices. I don't like, um, I'm not a big fan of the mouse in general. 
And so, you know, I used a, a roll on um, trackballs, and I actually use this thing called a Contour Designs Roller Mouse now, which is a funny track bar. Um, I could show you potentially, um, but basically, it's this it's this bar that rolls forward and back to get up vertical motion, and then slides left and right to get horizontal motion. And you combine those two, and you get you know all three dimensions. So it's really uh, or all two, but it's a really uh, really nice little device, and it keeps your hands much closer to the keyboard because you're not bouncing off. It's uh, it sits right below your keyboard. So any event, but yes, launch bar, wonderful. Yes, good good one. And 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 folks, for if you haven't um, if you haven't used Launch Bar, it, you've got it, you've got just the barest taste of it with uh, Spotlight in on the Mac yes. because if you type uh, what Command Space, you get the Spotlight Bar. Well, that will do about what Adam, one percent of what Launch Bar will do. But well, here's the that. real key. It's just that easy. Spotlight is stupid. Launch Bar is smart. So Spotlight, you can hit Command Space and type Contacts. Um, or CON, and it will, and Spotlight will figure out that you want the Contacts app and let you launch it. But with with uh, with Launch Bar, you can it will learn from what you type, and so you can say, for instance, I want you know I'm going to type net. Do I want the network preference pane or the network utility? Well, you know, once you've selected it once or twice in in Launch Bar, it knows that when you type net, you want one or the other, and not and, and not the other one. Whereas Spotlight will never learn. Um, it is it is fixed in what it can do, and so you can actually get Launch Bar to do some pretty interesting things. Where you know it will have, because it, it, once you've launched things, it knows like you want that thing, and so you can actually get it down to one character often. Um, you know when I type you know N, it's going to probably start giving me the network preference pane because I open that an awful lot, and um, so that's a really really fast way to do things. But I'm, again, I'm fast enough on the keyboard that I'll often type, you know, two or three characters and hit return without even thinking. And and it's it's one of those it's like it's like handwriting recognition or voice recognition, where it trains you and you train it. Um, so you know you've like you know I don't even know why I type you know uh, well for a long time I was using Acrobat seven eight and nine, and I actually had Launch Bar trained to do I could type A seven A eight and A nine um, to launch the appropriate version of Adobe Acrobat. And so that was, you know, that was, this, you know, subsequently I've been able to ditch 7 and 8. And so now I only have Acrobat 9, and I've actually done something different using Keyboard Maestro, um, where I type uh, Command Control Option O while I've selected a file in the Finder, and that opens in Acrobat as opposed to in Preview, which is my default PDF Previewer. So, because that's one of those things where, you know, the Mac is a little, a little annoying these days. You know, you have to, you, you can only have one app that opens a, a particular document type by default. So, that allows me to say, hey, I'm in production mode right now. Every PDF I'm going to work on needs to open an Acrobat as opposed to in, in preview. As you can tell, Adam and I feel kind of passionately about Launch Bar. <laughs> 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 and and actually, Launch Bar, I will say, it's a commercial program, great program. I, I highly recommend it. But if you wanted to get a taste of it, there's a bunch of others, um, Quicksilver, Alfred, um, probably two or three others yet that are this, are similar and give you the same kinds of capabilities but are free. So if you just want to get a, a feel for what Launch Bar would be like for free, you can try one of the others. Every time I test them, I come back to Launch Bar. You know, yes. they work, they're good. You know, I don't want to say anything bad about them, but there's just always something that's a little bit fussier about them that I that Launch Bar doesn't have. It's just it's fast and unobtrusive and gets out of my way. So, yeah, and and, and I have to add this. I apologize because we need to move on. But the one thing, <laughs> Alfred Alfred is a commercial program. Quicksilver was the darling of the launcher set for a while, and then something happened with the developer, and he kind of disappeared. And and my theory always goes, I'd rather pay for something than use a free option because there's a developer behind it and they they care enough that they're trying to make money on it. I think they'll keep it up more. more. In this situation, that's exactly what happened. Quicksilver was here. Quicksilver was gone. Quicksilver's back. Launch Bar has been here the whole time. So that's yep. my commercial for paid software. Excuse me, paid software as opposed to free. Adam, how about if we uh, jump to the iOS side? We'll kind of do back Sure, and forth. sure. Let's see. Well, okay, I am going to go for the app that I probably use more than any other on iOS. Um, keep in mind, I'm a runner. Uh, so I spend a lot of time outside, and I care fairly deeply what the weather is going to be like. Now, the weather app in iOS that Apple gives you is just terrible. 
I mean, it's 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 so pointless. It's, you know, you may as well just if, if you could delete it, I would recommend you delete it, um, and because uh, it's it's just a waste of time. But for um, the weather app, and I've looked at a bunch of these over the over the years. The one that I've come to really really like is Weatherbug, and what I like about it is that it has um, different layers of of, uh, of predictions, so you can pretty easily say, you know, I want to see, you know, just a real rough overview what's the weather going to be like tomorrow or the next day or whatever. But then you can also go in and see what the hourly predictions are likely to be, uh, which is helpful, again, if I'm saying, well, I'm, should I run in the morning or should I run in the afternoon? And then even better, and this is where I spend most of my time, is you can get the radar really easily. And so you can see where the rain is. And you don't have to uh, you don't have to guess at whether or not it's going to rain at eleven o'clock. You can look and say, yeah, there's a blob of rain. It's coming this way because you can animate the radar, so you can see exactly whether it's going to hit you or not. Um, and particularly after you've watched the radar for a while, you get a real sense for whether or not something is going to you know going to hit you if it's going to slide around, if it's you know how fast it's moving, all that kind of stuff. And so I find that just tremendously useful. And I mean, part of this is I grew up on a farm. And, uh, and we made hay, and when you make hay, you need a couple of days for it to dry. And this was in the early 80s, and the best we had was, you know, watching the, you know, w the weather program in the morning on TV, and then we had one of those weather cubes that you could get at Radio Shack, it would be just the NOAA weather forecast, and we listened to that thing all the t you know, every time we went in the house, we'd hit the weather cube, because it had this big switch, it was the only, didn't, you couldn't tune it to anything, it was just the weather, so you'd hit this big switch, and it would come on, and there it would be this loop of, like, five minutes of weather and we listened to that thing religiously because you had to know on the farm you know what should you do next you know how much time did you have before that front that's coming through is going to hit and dump some rain so so I you know I, I realize I'm a bit more weather involved than many people and you all live in Southern California where I hear the weather is always nice um, but I don't live there I live in upstate New York where the weather is often truly disgusting and so you really need to uh, check in on it to see what you're going to get hit with when Adam put Weatherbug down, I I wanted to second it. It's it's my second. Well, it's tied for my most used weather app, um, <laughs> and and so everything Adam just said, I'm like him. I agree with you with 100 percent, and I too am addicted to radar images. Um, but there's there's one that I also have found that I like almost as much for a different reason, um, called Sky Motion. What Sky Motion will do is it will identify your location using the GPS, and it will tell you in the next for, for only the next 120 minutes when you can expect rain, or what mm. or snow or whatever precipitation, and it and it's not just saying okay it's I'm in Ithaca or in my case I'm in Harrisburg, it says you know you are at. Coventry Drive and Arbor Court, and so this is when the rain or whatever yeah. will get there, and and it's it's been amazingly accurate. I was at an outdoor concert, uh, I guess two weeks ago, and had Sky Motion, and it's like, okay, the rain will get here in 49 minutes. All right, hurry up, band, finish your set, and within like literally a couple minutes to exactly where I was standing, that's when the rain started. So it sounds like. It sounds like what they're doing is exactly the same thing as you know what I sort of do manually with the radar. You know, as intuitively yes. is is you can just predict, and and I mean that's the beauty of Weatherbug, of course. You know, again, it's not it gives you a prediction based on your more general location, but there's a pin right where you are, and so yeah. you can just you know, I mean, and I've even gone. You know, there was one day, like almost a month or so ago, when. I finished, you know, I finished what I was doing work-wise towards the end of the day, and I kind of, you know, walk away from my desk and look out the window, and to the north and west is this wall of storm clouds. I mean, you know, light over here, dark over here, and uh, and I and I, holy crow, and you know, pulled up the weather the radar, <laughs> and I could see there's this, you know, this huge, you know, fairly significant storm passing, you know, like a mile north of me. I mean, it didn't rain here at all. Um, but it was right there, and so yeah, these things. I mean, you know, I, I don't. Does, does Sky Motion have uh, have push notifications? You know, can you say, you know, tell me when I'm going to get wet, and you know, 20 minutes before I get wet or something? 
you know, I, I'm not a big fan of push notifications because after a while they start to get annoying and I find I don't pay attention to them. And I don't mean from sky motion. I mean from just about anything. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm very sparse in my push. Um, I think it, prob it probably does. I'm not sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it just I found it really nice to not have to do that interpretation and pretend that I'm Willard Scott. Just look at it. <laughs> it says, you know, you have 10 minutes to get inside. So you just wanted to be a weatherman when you grew up, right? Yeah. Stand in front of the big screen. Yeah, play one on TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I think that takes us back to the Mac. Okay, back to the Mac. Um, I'm going to switch gears entirely and move away from utilities um, to a big app, um, which is Google Chrome. I know Safari comes with you know with Mac OS 10 and everyone likes Safari and there's nothing really horribly wrong with Safari but um, and, and frankly it's gotten a lot better in, in Safari 6 for, for one thing but with Google Chrome I've just found over the years that it's smaller and faster and um, just less trouble um, with the way I use web browsers than Safari. Um, I'm not really very good at about closing my tabs and so I mean like right now I probably have 70 tabs open um, and because of the way Google Chrome keeps every tab as a separate process no one tab, you know, you can't, you don't get this big monolithic app which is starts dragging down your Mac. Um, they all, you know, they all just sort of go to sleep in the background independently and if one is bad you can, you can get rid of it by just closing the tab. Um, the real reason, honestly, why I use Google Chrome, and I said this did just change with Safari, is that Google Chrome has, has always had this single bar. Doesn't have that. Never had the separate Google search bar. And so when you type in the bar, it tries to do the right thing. And usually, when I type in the in the bar of the editors field, I want to go to a particular website. I may or may not be typing the exact domain properly, but I want to go to that website. And so what, by default, what Chrome will do is it'll do a Google search, just like Safari does now. Um, but I figured out a way um, to use another service that Google calls Browse by Name. And it's a slightly funny name, funny name, actually. But what this means is that, for instance, I can go to Chrome and I can type the word White House into the address bar, and it'll take me to the whitehouse.gov website. Um, I could type the word Green Star Co-op and it would take me to the food co-op I go to in Ithaca. It wouldn't bother to dump me to Google because it would go to basically do the Google search and say, well, he really means this. You know, everyone who searches for this phrase really goes to this website, so I'm not even going to bother to show them the search results and make him click again. And so that kind of direct access to exactly what I want um, has been, you know, a huge part of how I use the Mac for a long time. And Safari will does it do better now with its unified unified address bar that will do Google searches and things. But it's not, it's just not quite what I'm looking for still with the browse by name feature, which I've had, you know, first in Firefox and then in Chrome. Um, but I think this falls back into, you know, I'm a keyboard person, I'm a word person. I think in terms of words, and so you know, I don't, don't use bookmarks. Um, you know, I have, I have, you know. You know, 10 or 15 in my bookmarks bar right across the top for, you know, the sites that I go to absolutely all the time, and that's about it. And after that, really, I just, you know, I rely on Google to uh, to, to feed me the, the websites that I want, and, you know, I'll very, very seldom do I not get exactly what I want when I type into Chrome's address bar. Good pick. Good pick. I, I, I have to explain. I use Chrome. I use Firefox. I use Safari because I, I have split personalities. Me too. Um, <laughs> Him too. I have the things. Yeah, I, I, I've. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry. <laughs> Don't usually twitch like that when I switch. No. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I'm. I, I have my personal stuff. Then I have the Mac Voices, Mac Voices Group stuff, and then I have the stuff for the office. And I find it really annoying to be signing in and out constantly of services um, that are used for different things. So I use primarily Chrome for work. I use Firefox for the, the the online publishing stuff, and then I use Safari for the personal. Now, I'm sure that there's someone out there that's going to say, "Oh, you can do this with tabs and this and this," and and I, I know that there are ways to accomplish what I'm doing easier. But frankly, this is simple. I've got three icons. If I'm logged into a browser, I kind of know which personality I'm using and what I can expect to find there. So I like them. I like them all. I I agree with you. There are times 
at, at any given moment, I think any of them seem a little more stable than, than the other. The one nice thing about Chrome, of course, is that it handles Flash outside of your machine, and that's oh, a yeah, really, yeah. really nice thing. Yeah, Flash has its own. Uh, Chrome has its own built-in Flash viewer. So if you want to use Flash, you can do it in Chrome. And Chrome auto updates all the time. You get no options for this. And the utility of that is, is that you can be certain that there will be no Flash vulnerabilities that will ever, you'll ever be subject to because Google updates Flash instantly upon you know, Adobe finding a problem and fixing it, whereas um, even the Adobe um, auto updates have not been as fast in the past. So I actually also I do the same thing. I use I use Firefox and Chrome and Safari. Mostly Chrome, then Safari, then Firefox. Actually, the browser that I use actually more than Firefox at this point is Camino. And it's not because Camino is a great browser in any way, shape, or form, but you were kind of alluding to this is that there's so many logins now. And I sometimes even need to log into sites as different people. And so a browser will remember your login via a cookie. And so you have to go to a different browser if you don't want to be logged in um, as, that, as that person. And so Camino is my I am not logged in as anything browser. It's the trying to simulate what someone else would see if they are not me in any way, shape, or form. And, um, and so that's, you know, I figure that's, you know, as, as, you know, as good as it gets. And I can actually, I will blow it away in terms of its cache and its cookies and its bookmarks and everything so that it can be as clean as possible at all times. And that, that I just like to have that ability to check things on occasion. Um, but, but yes, if you end up going to a site and you, you, know, you find you need to log in as two different people, maybe you're logged in as you and as your club, um, that's a great thing. Use Safari for one, Chrome for the other. You know, that, that's just key. I, I have to admit, I think you just gave me a fourth personality. I'd never thought of having a fourth one just as completely anonymous, not yeah. anybody. I like that. Well, Chrome has a feature, um, I think Safari is something like this too. Chrome has a, a, what's called a new incognito window. Um, you can choose it from the file menu, and that is the don't track me, don't, you know, don't, I'm not logged in as anything, don't, uh, don't record my history, don't send my, you know, information to the remote, uh, remote servers, anything like that. Uh, so every now and then I will pop up a new incognito window when I want to do a search um, for something that I, you know, just don't want on my machine. As a, as a journalist, sometimes I have to do that. I'm like, ooh, I don't want that on my machine. <laughs> I, yeah, and I'm just paranoid enough that even though it says incognito, I'd rather use a separate program. I just, it just feels better. It just feels better. <laughs> Adam, how about if we take a quick break and ask the, uh, the audience if they have any questions or comments on what we've covered so far. They're taking Folks. such good notes. I love this. Guy yeah. notes. Yeah. Folks, uh, anything? Yeah, we have a question from Tom. Hi, Adam. Any Chrome extensions that you particularly recommend? Can we repeat any the question? Chrome? Yeah, oh, any, Chrome yeah, extensions. Yes. Um, that's an interesting question. Let me let me go look and see what I've got loaded because I'm not 100% certain what I use. Um, okay, I'll just sort of run down the list of things that I have enabled. It's not it's not that many. So um, I have one, one password enabled because I use one password to store my credit card information for putting into uh, into browsers. Um, I have LastPass enabled because I actually much prefer LastPass to 1Password for automatically logging me into all of these websites that I have to log into all the time. 1Password will store your username and password, but you have to take an action to get it to autofill. Whereas LastPass, I can go to this website and boom, it will autofill and auto log in, and I'm there working. And so I use this so often that it is actually worth the extra, you know, five or ten seconds every time I need it to have LastPass do it instead of one password. Um, in theory, I have something called page one banish multi-page articles, um, which is one of those things that, like, Safari will try to do as well, where, you know, if they make you go to the next page to keep it in the article, I hate that. Just hate it, hate it, hate it. But um, I don't think this works because, I, at least on the sites where I've hit this recently, the New York Times, um, Ars Technica, um, I'm not sure it's do it working properly. So, so I don't recommend that. I have something called Readium in, um, installed, which is an extension that can read EPUBs in Chrome. Um, it's mostly a kind of professional interest. It's not very good, and it's still in you know it's version 0.5, not not even release yet but it's something that I want to pay attention to in case it, it, it becomes interesting at some point. Um, 
And then the last thing I have is something called YSlow, which is a, a Yahoo tool that um, allows you to evaluate um, website loading performance. So every now and then when I'm trying to figure out why something on one of my sites is not working properly, I'll load up YSlow. So not too many of these, um, of these extensions. Oh, there's a couple I see here I actually want to mention as well because I don't use them in, in uh, Chrome, but it's a good opportunity to mention them. Um, there is a, uh, um, I use Gmail. So I'm actually reading my, my, my mail on, in Gmail's web interface. And this is another program that I'll mention called Mailplane to do that. But one of the reasons why, or some of the reasons why I like Gmail is there's extensions that work with Gmail too um, for the browsers. And so one of those is called Reportive. And what Reportive does is it looks up the email addresses of the people who have, I'm exchanging email with on the public social networking sites. So Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Flickr, Foursquare, all those kinds of things. And it tells me what their public face is. In essence, I can see a picture of them usually. I can see what their latest tweets are, all that kind of stuff, they're what position they hold, where they're located. So, you know, I'm sitting here looking at Chuck right now. There's, you know, Chuck, he's in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. He's the founder, producer, host at the Mac Voices Group. Um, you know, there's his... his uh, his last uh, few tweets, um, here's his Facebook uh, post, things like that. And so when I'm exchanging email with someone, um, I can much more easily get a sense of who they are and what they know um, from Reportive. And what I really want um, is I want some developer to write me one of these little plugins for Reportive so that I can get it to go directly into my account management stuff and say, you know, this person has bought this Take Control book and there are Tibbet subscriber to this edition and things like that because Reportive is extensive, extensible. So that's something which I like a great deal. Um, and I have the extension, um, I don't have it installed right now because I don't read my Gmail and Chrome usually, but I, I have the extension. And then the other one is, um, there's another one, similar um, Gmail thing called Boomerang. And what Boomerang does is, is allows you to schedule email. So you can say, send this email in a week or uh, you know, in two days. And it also will remind you if you don't get a reply. Or even if you do get a reply, you can say, tell me, tell me that I haven't gotten a reply back from this person a week later. And I find that tremendously useful because, you know, someone sends you mail, you reply, and you think, huh, I need to hear back from them. If I don't hear back from them, it's a problem. But you're going to remember this in a week, you know. So you want, you know, you want Boomerang to tell you, hey, you asked me to check up on this a week. You haven't heard back. Now you need to act on it. So that's the uh, that's the other extension in um, in Chrome that I said I don't have it enabled for Chrome, but uh, but I do uh, I do use it in other apps. Big big seconds here for Boomerang and Reportive, but Boomerang especially because it's it is so nice to be able to queue things up and send them later and not have to worry about it. Uh, I'm sure we've all done it that you set a reminder on your calendar or something that says, oh, send this out now. And with Boomerang, you don't have to. So yeah, great, great choice, great choice. Any other questions or comments before we move on, folks? Any questions? No questions. Must be doing okay. a good job, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to take the lead on this one because you you mentioned it and you also mentioned an option. I I prefer one password, um, and I I don't care, folks, if you if you use one password or LastPass. If you don't do anything out of this meeting, please go buy a password manager because it it will allow you to use the more complex passwords. But Adam, the thing that I like about one password is uh, the sync through Dropbox, so that I have it on my, all my iOS devices. Um, I have it on all my Macs. In other words, it's sort of self-managing, and it's just mm -hmm. ubiquitous. It's everywhere for me. I don't know if LastPass will do that. Honestly, I'm not 100% certain. LastPass is a browser extension only. Um, and it does, they do have something in iOS, and I'm not entirely sure what that is. Um, the simple fact is that, again, kind of what I was saying before, I don't use iOS devices for the same things. So I don't hardly ever need to log into sites that are backed by LastPass. And if I did, I could log into the LastPass site, you know, you know, get my get my uh, my my passwords out of there, and then go bring them. In. You know, the one or two times I've had to do this over the last X years, um, that's how I've done it. Um, one password. The one problem I've been having, and this is true for LastPass as well, um, is that many companies are coming up with iOS apps to match their websites, 
And so you can log into the website perfectly easily with 1Password or LastPass, but it's not going to do you one whit of good in logging into an iOS app on your, on your device. So you're going to have to have some way to get those passwords you know, back out in a way that you can see them and type them if you're going to log into uh, an iOS app that way. So um, I actually do want to, to recommend something to you guys. Um, um, at Tidbits, we did a, a presentation two months ago or so called uh, Protecting Your Digital Life. That's part of our Tidbits Presents series. And it's an hour-long presentation that was kind of spurred by uh, Matt Honan, the Gizmodo and Wired writer, being hacked and all the things that, you know, bad things that happened to him because of uh, security lapses at Amazon and Apple and Gmail and things like that. So, um, but I recommend you, re you, you listen to that because we talk a bit about passwords and, and, and some really important things such as do not reuse passwords across sites. Give every site a different password. Use a password manager like 1Password or LastPass so you don't have to try to remember them at all times. Um, one that I've been, been talking more and more about is if you're going to have to use a, a password on an iOS device, think about how you're going to build in things like capital letters and punctuation and numbers so you don't have to switch the keyboards more than once. That the more times you have to switch the keyboard, the harder it is going to be typed correctly and the more likely you are to make mistakes. Um, so that's kind of a, that's kind of a big deal. Um, and um, I, you know, I know a lot of people like the truly random passwords for their for their you know their websites. Just have LastPass or One Password generate the password and then remember it. I'm not a big fan of that. I I sort of feel like that that you know puts me at a disadvantage at certain times. And so um, I prefer the technique of where you come up with a password that can be customized per site. So you have, uh, I'll give you the example I gave to the, the Rochester group that I was talking to last week. You know, your, 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 your password is monkey brains, and, um, and you, you may then use monkey brains in the first three characters of the website's name. So for Amazon, it would be monkey brains, AMA, and then some digits or punctuation to make it a good, strong password. And so the only thing you change from site to site would be those three letters. Now, so that you can remember it, you can say, "Oh, I'm at Google now. Oh, I'm at Apple now. Oh, I'm, you know, wherever," and still be able to come up with your password. But it's still a good, strong password. Can't be guessed. And if it's if it's uh, broken on one site, say, you know, the Dropbox break in, or the Sony break in, those kinds of things, your other sites aren't at risk because that password has been been revealed. So um, I prefer that to uh, to to the totally random ones, just from the standpoint of sometimes you've got to type it. And you've, you know, if you can't, if you can't, uh, can't get it back, or you know, can't, can't uh, see it at the same time because you're an iOS device, random is annoying. Yeah, and th the way that one password gets around that, especially on the iOS devices, uh, of course, it works the same on all Macs, but on the iOS devices. There was a time you know, you had to go into one password, copy the password, then jump back to Safari and paste it in. Well, they solved that because then now they built their own browser into the one password app. So once I'm in the one password app, if I want to go to my Amazon account and log in, I just tap the the uh, the button for my Amazon account in one password. It launches their browser, prefills and logs me in. So it, it it's you don't it's, find it's that nice. you don't find that a little fussy with the you have to figure out which browser you want to be in before you go somewhere. Because I would never think, oh, I want to go to Amazon. I'd better launch one password. I would think I want to launch Safari. Uh, Adam, it depends. If I'm going to log into Amazon and I know I'm going to buy something, or I really need, the, you know, the full services, I'm just going to look up, say, a product spec. I don't need to. But no, it, if anything, it means that I spend more time within the One Password app, just because I know that then I'm going to have all my passwords accessible to me. Right. Okay. So it's you know whatever works. But this is the this is the first example of one of those apps that crosses iOS and Mac and kind of does so seamlessly. Right. And, and LastPass, I believe, does something does something similar. I haven't looked into their iOS app because I don't really run into that. Um, they solve it mostly by being web-based. Um, for me, I, I'm finding more of my stuff being web-based or Dropbox-based, as 1Password is, actually. Um, something we may get to is the you know sort of iCloud syncing. And I'm not using much of anything that's doing anything via iCloud syncing at this point. Because of the length of this meeting, we're breaking it down into two parts. Part two will be available soon. Thanks for listening.
Mac Voices TV is part of the Mac Voices Group at macvoicesgroup.com. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.